Now, for those of you who've not been to an ISS event before, uh, the form is that the professor is going to talk for about half an hour or so. Um, we'll then have an opportunity for questions and discussions, and we'll end the event in about an hour. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, uh, my topic is the question, is war declining? Why and where? And it is based on my recently published book, The Causes of War and the Spread of Peace, But Will War Rebound? Which is itself uh, an extension of my war in human civilization. So most people are very surprised by the claim that we live in the most peaceful period in history. Are we not flooded with media reports and images of conflicts around the world today, some of them very active and bloody, and others seemingly waiting to happen? Have the United States and its, ally, and its allies, including Britain, not been involved in a series of messy wars over the past few decades? Does the rise of China not herald the end of the post-Cold War moment of peace between the great powers? Furthermore, if there has been a decline in belligerency, when did it begin? With uh, the end of the Cold War in 1945, or perhaps earlier, and what caused it? The, the so-called long peace among the great powers, that is, no great power war after 1945, is widely recognized and is widely attributed to the nuclear factor, a decisive factor, to be sure, which concentrated the minds of all the protagonists wonderfully, as they say about the hanging rope. The democratic peace, the absence of war between democracies, has been equally recognized. However, the decrease in war had been very marked even before the nuclear era and has encompassed non-democratic as well as uh, democracies. The occurrence of war and overall mortality rate in war has sharply decreased from 1815 onward, especially in the developed world. During the 19th century, between 1815 and 1914, wars among industrializing countries declined in their frequency to about a third of what they had been in the previous centuries, an unprecedented change. Compared to the record during the 18th century, Austria and Prussia, for example, neither of them a democracy, fought about a third to a quarter as much during, um, during the century after 1815. Indeed, the long peace after, eight, after 1945, 70 years to date, to date and counting, was preceded by the second longest peace ever, no war among the great powers between 1871 and 1914. That is the end of the, Frank the Franco-Prussian War and World War I. This is 43 years in all. And by the third longest peace, between 1815 and 1854, 39 years. Thus, the three longest period of periods of peace by far in the modern great power system have all occurred after 1815, with the first two taking place before the nuclear age. No similar long peace period had occurred in the modern great power system before 1815. I'll, I trust this more. No. Sorry about that. Okay. Here, the long peace phenomenon. This is the current one. This is the one between 17, uh, 1871 and 1914. And this is the first one, 1815 to 1945, peace among the great powers. Here you see the 18th century. And you see the absence of a long peace phenomenon. If you go back to the 17th century or earlier, you'll see the same thing. The long peace phenomenon is something new. This striking phenomenon cannot be accidental. A decline in belligerency began from 1815, not for 1945 or 1989. Clearly, one needs to explain the entire period of reduced belligerency since 1815, while also accounting for the glaring divergence from the trend. Himalaya size, the two world wars. So we have these two 
things that we want to explain, the long peace phenomena and the huge exception uh, from this trend, if indeed it's, it is a trend, the two world wars. So there is a tendency, I'm sure that you, all of you intuitively have uh, uh, come up with the same explanation. There is a tendency to assume that wars have declined in frequency during the past two century, centuries because they have become too lethal and expensive, fewer but more ruinous wars. This hypothesis barely holds, however, because relative to population and wealth, wars have not become more lethal and costly than earlier in history. The, the wars of the 19th century from 1815 to 1914, the most peaceful century in European history, were in fact particularly light in comparative ter terms. Prussia won the Germans' wars of unification in short and decisive campaigns and at a remarkably low price, and yet Germany did not fight again for 43 years. True, the world wars, especially World War II, were certainly on the upper scale of the range in terms of casualties. Yet contrary to widespread assumptions, they were far from being the excep exceptional in history. We need to look at relative casualties, general mortality rates in wars, rather than at the aggregates created by the fact that many states participated in the world wars. Yeah, uh, so this is not very clear, but this is World War II in comparative terms. That is, casualties in uh, relation uh, to the overall population. I'll, I'll just give a few example, uh, examples now of very of very well-known cases, just to make the point. So, uh, for example, in the Peloponnesian War, uh, the Greek World War between Athens and its allies and uh, Sparta and its allies, this is 431 to 403 BC, Athens is estimated to have lost between a quarter and a third of its population. More than Germany in the two world, war, in the two world wars combined. In the first three years of the Second Punic War, this is Hannibal's War, uh, 218 to 22, uh, 202 BC, Rome lost some 50,000 male citizens of the ages of 17 to 46 out of a total of about 200,000 in, uh, in these ages. This was roughly 25% of the military age cohorts in only three years. The same, at the same, the same range as the Russian military casualties and higher than the German rates in World War II. Similarly, in the 13th century, the Mongol conquests inflicted on the societies of China and Russia casualties and destructions that were among the, mo the highest ever suffered during historical times. Even by the lowest estimates, Casualties were at least as high, and in China almost definitely far higher than the Soviet Union horrific rate in World War II of about 15% of its population. A final example, during the Thirty Years' War, this is 1618 to 1648, population loss in Germany is estimated at between a fifth and a third. Either way, again, higher than the German casualties in the First and Second World Wars combined. None of these wars, needless to say, stopped the power involved from fighting on very intensively as they had before. This goes against our intuitions and, and I'll explain why it goes against our intuition. People often assume that more developed military technology during modernity must mean greater lethality and destructiveness. But in fact, it also means greater protective power, as with mechanized armor, mechanized speed and agility, and defensive electronic measures. Offensive and defensive advances generally rise in tandem, 
and tend to offset each other. In addition, it is all too often forgotten that, that the vast majority of the many millions of non-combatants killed by Germany during World War II, Jews, Soviet prisoners of war, Soviet civilians, fell victim to, internet, to intentional starvation, exposure to the elements and mass executions rather than to any sophisticated military technology. Okay, this is just about, you know, the uh, miseries of war. Just a reminder. Instances of genocide in general during the 20th century, much as earlier in history, were carried out with the simplest technologies as the Rwanda genocide horrifically reminded us. Nor is it true that during the past two centuries, um, that war during the past two centuries have become economically more costly than they were earlier in history. Again, relative to overall wealth. War always involved massive economic exertion and was the single most expensive item of state spending. Both 16th and 17th century Spain and 18th century France, for example, were, were economically ruined by war and staggering war debts, which in the French case brought about the revolution. Furthermore, death by starvation in pre-modern wars was widespread. Think Yemen today. What then is the cause of the decline in belligerency? Even before the middle of the 19th century, during the first long peace, having noticed the long peace, this was very unusual, at, even at the time, thinkers such as Saint-Simon, Auguste Comte, and John Stuart Mill, who were quick to note the change, realized that it was caused by the advent of the Industrial Commercial Revolution, the most pro pro profound transformation of human society since the Neolithic adoption of agriculture some 10,000 years ago. In the first place, given explosive growth in per capita wealth, about 30 to 40, for, uh, about 30 to 50 fold from the onset of the revolution to the present, the trap that had plagued mod uh, pre-modern societies, famously described by the demographer and economist Thomas uh, Malthus, in 1799, whereby slow growth in wealth was absorbed by more children and more mouths to feed, has been broken. Wealth no longer constitutes a fundamentally finite equality and a zero-sum game when the only question is, is how it is divided, and with force functioning as a major means of attaining a larger share of the pie. The pie has been continuously growing with wealth now derived predominantly from economic growth and investment at home, from which war tends to be a, a wasteful destruction. Yes. So, uh, you see, here is the flat. This is, uh, this is uh, wealth per capita. It's flat until about 1800, and then you see a, an exponential growth these are the parts of the world that have success, so far successfully undergone uh, industrialization and modernization, the usual suspects in North America, Western Europe, Oceania, and so forth. And here are the newcomers to the trend uh, now picking up. Secondly, the significance of trade in the economy has ballooned to entirely new dimensions precisely because of the new process of industrial growth. Greater freedom of trade has become all the more attractive in the industrial age for the simple reason that the overwhelming share of fast-growing, diverse, diver, diversifying production has now been intended uh, for sale in the marketplace rather than for direct consumption by the peasant producers themselves. 
Consequently, economies are no longer overwhelmingly autarkic, having become increasingly interconnected by specialization, specialization, scale and exchange. Foreign devastation potentially depresses the entire system and is de detrimental to uh, a state's own well-being. What John, Mill, John Stuart Mill discerned in the abstract in the 1840s formed the cornerstone uh, of economist John Maynard Keynes' criticism of the harsh reparations imposed on Germany after World War I. If the, Germany, if the German economy was not allowed to revive, he argued, the global economy could not revive either. This was a matter of self-interest self for the victors. Thus, the greater the yield of competitive economic cooperation, the more counterproductive and less attractive conflict becomes, rather than war becoming more costly, as is widely believed, it is in fact peace that has been uh, growing more profitable. So we have two sides of, uh, of an equation here, and obviously the two is a continuum, uh, and, but the change takes place on the peace side rather than on the war side. If so, why have wars continued to occur during the past two centuries, albeit at a much lower frequency? In the first place, ethnic and nationalist tension often overrode the logic of the new economic realities, accounting for most wars in Europe between 1815 and 1945. They continue to do so today, especially in the less developed parts of the globe. Moreover, the logic of the new economic realities receded during the late 19th century and early 20th century as the great powers resumed protectionist policies and expanded them to, expanded them to the undeveloped parts of the world with the new imperialism from 1882 on. This development signaled that the emergent global economy might become partitioned rather than open, with each imperial domain becoming close to everybody else. Free trade has the effect of disassociating economic access from the confines of political borders and sovereignty. It is not necessary to politically possess a territory in order to benefit from it. Furthermore, the size of a nation makes little difference in an open international economy. The citizens of little Luxembourg are as rich as, if not richer than, the citizens of the United States. By contrast, size uh, becomes the key to economic success in a closed neo-mercantilist international economy because small countries cannot possibly produce everything by themselves. <coughs> Moreover, in a partitioned global economy, economic power increases national strength, while national strength defends and increases economic power. It becomes necessary uh, to politically own a territory in order to profit from it. Hence the heightened tensions between the great powers associated with the imperialist race before World War I. The change was completed in the 1930s with the Great Depression as the USA, Britain and France practically closed their territories and empires to imports by high tariffs. Britain, the former champion of free trade and the larger imperial power, reversed course and closed its borders to imports with the policy of imperial preference. This is 1932. For the territorially confined Germany and Japan, the need to break away into an imperial Lebensraum or East Asian co-prosperity sphere seemed practically pressing. Here lay the seeds of the two world wars. Furthermore, the retreat from economic liberalism in the first decades of the 20th century sparked and was sparked by 
the rise to power of anti-liberal and anti-democratic political ideologies and regimes incorporating a creed of violence, communism, and fascism. Since 1945, the decline of major war has deepened further. Nuclear weapons have been a crucial factor in this process, but no less significant have been the institut institutionalization of free trade and the closely related process of rapid and sustained economic growth. The spread of liberal democracy has been equally potent. Indeed, although the non-liberal and non-democratic states also became much less belligerent during the industrial age, it is the liberal democracies that have been the most attuned to its pacifying aspects. Relying on arbitrary and coercive force at home, non-democratic countries have found it most natural to use force abroad. By contrast, liberal democratic societies are socialized to peaceful, low-mediated uh, low relations at home, and the citizens have grown to expect the same norm be applied internationally. Living in increasingly tolerant societies, they have grown more receptive of the other's point of view. Promoting freedom, legal equality, and political participation domestically, liberal democratic powers, though initially in possession of vast empires, have found it increasingly difficult to justify, to justify uh, ruling over foreign uh, peoples without their consent. And sanctifying life, liberty, and human rights, they have proven to be failures in forceful suppression. Furthermore, with the individual life and pursuit of happiness elevated above group values, sacrifice of life in war has increasingly lost legitimacy in the liberal democracies. War retains legitimacy only under narrow and narrowing formal and practical conditions and is generally viewed as extremely abhorrent and undesirable. Thus, modernization, most notably its liberal path, has sharply reduced the prevalence of war as the violent option for fulfilling human desires has become much less rewarding than the peaceful option of competitive cooperation. Furthermore, in societies of plenty, people become risk-averse. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll mention this too. Another element of the modern condition, with the much increased sexual opportunity within societies, young men now are more reluctant to leave behind the pleasure of life for the rigors and chastity of the field. Make love, not war, was the slogan of the powerful anti-war youth campaign of the 1960s, which not accidentally coincided with a far-reaching liberalization of sexual norms. Yeah. If you were a young man in the, in the 60s in the USA and you had... Uh, the option, either go to Vietnam or go to college and have fun, but the choice is very clear. The, the fruits of these deepening trends and sensibilities have been nothing short of miraculous. The probability of war between affluent democracies has declined to a vanishing point where they no longer even see the need to prepare for the possibility of a militarized dip dispute with one another. The security dilemma between neighbors, that seemingly intrinsic feature of international anarchy, no longer exists among them. This is most conspicuously the case in North America and Western Europe, the, wor the world's most modernized and liberal democratic regions. Thus, Holland and Belgium, no longer fear in the slightest a German or French invasion, a historically unprecedented situation. Similarly, Canada is not at all concerned about the prospect of conquest by the United States, though people find it difficult to explain why exactly this is so. In East Asia, the most developed countries, such as Japan, 
South Korea and Taiwan, even though for historical reasons there is no love lost between them, do not fear war among themselves or with any other developed country. However, they are deeply apprehensive of being attacked by less developed neighbors such as China or North Korea. Thus, world's geographical center of gravity have, has shifted radically. The modernized, economically developed parts of the world have become a zone of peace. War now seems to be confined to the less developed parts of the globe, the world's a zone of war, where countries uh, that have lagged behind in modernization and its pacifying spin-off effects occasionally still fight among themselves as well as with developed countries. Okay, this uh, map I think is abundantly clear. You see the most affluent parts of the world, North America, Western Europe, Oceania, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan. These are the zones of peace where war is not even feared or expected within them. And you see the uh, poorest parts of the world, uh, most of Africa, uh, parts of uh, my own Middle East and South uh, and Central Asia, uh, where war is still very much expected. I just want to point out that much the same applies to civil wars. Modernized, economically developed and liberal democratic countries have become practically free of civil wars on account of their stronger consensual nature, plurality, tolerance, and indeed the greater legitimacy for peaceful secession. By contrast, undeveloped and developing countries remain very susceptible to civil wars and all the more so as many of them are e ethnically fragmented and possessing a weak central government. At this happy junction, it's time to turn our attention to some major controlling forces and stress that the dramatic spread of peace is far from being foolproof and free from shadows and challenges. Perhaps the most significant challenge is the return of the capitalist, non-democratic great powers, a regime type that has been absent from the international uh, system since the defeat of Germany and Japan in 1945. The massive growth of formerly communist and fast industrialized authoritarian capitalist China represents the greatest change in the global balance of power. You know all that, obviously. Russia, too, has retreated from its post-communist liberalism and has assumed an increasingly authoritarian and nationalist character coupled with a more aggressive stance as in Crimea, the Ukraine, and Syria. Yeah, the cartoonist of the, oh, sorry, of the Economist was uh, pretty optimistic at the time. Let's hope he was right. China's per capita production of around $8,000 to $9,000 is still only one-fifth to one-seventh of uh, that of the developed world. Will China become more assertive and aggressive as its wealth and power increase during the coming decades, or will, it, or will growing wealth and affluence make its people and government increasingly averse to military action, as is the case throughout the developed world? This is obviously... Uh, furthermore, will China and Russia eventually democratize with development? These are the most crucial political questions of the 21st century. The lessons of history are not as clear about the inevitability of the process as some progressive civis uh, tended to believe in the uh, end of history decade. Furthermore, since the outbreak of the economic crisis, the authoritarian great powers have gained much in confidence, while the hegemony and prestige 
of, the demo of uh, democratic capitalism have suffered a massive blow unparalleled since the 1930s and the rise, and the rise of the fascist and, communist, of fascist and communist totalitarianism. One hopes that the current economic and poli political uh, malaise in the West will not uh, be nearly as catastrophic, and yet the global allure of state-driven and nationalist capitalist authoritarianism may grow substantially. At the same time, American might, the main reason, not sufficiently appreciated for the triumph of democracy in the 20th century, is undergoing relative decline, though probably not as, as steep as it sometimes imagined. Deeply integrated into the world economy, the new capitalist authoritarian powers partake of the development, open trade, capitalist and affluent peace, but not of the liberal democratic one. The, demo the democratic and non-democratic powers may coexist more or less peacefully, armed because of mutual fear and suspicion, but there is also the prospect of more antagonistic relations, accentuate ideological rivalry, potential and actual conflict, intensified arms races, and new Cold Wars. Furthermore, the China, the China's and Russia's support for oppressive regime around the world, most notably today Syria and Iran, may be a foretaste of things to come. Furthermore, the prospect of renewed protectionism increases the likelihood of armed confrontation as production and trade are again linked to territory and direct rule. The system of trade, the, free, the system of free trade has been exploited by China in the direct theft of knowledge and the coercion of foreign companies to see, uh, to see know-how. These vices must be corrected. On the other hand, if protectionism and trade blocks are going to re-emerge, China's incentive to secure its control of, of vital resources, as in the South China Sea, might grow momentously. Finally, the, November, uh, the September 11, nine, uh, 2001 mega-terror attacks in the United States have turned attention to yet another shadow heavy, uh, hanging over the decline of belligerency, and this is unconventional terror, nuclear, biological, and chemical. Biological weapons have the greatest potential as the biote uh, biotechnological revolution is one of the spearheads of today's technological advance. A virulent laboratory cultivated strain of bacteria or virus, let alone a specially engineered superbug against which no immunization exists, might bring uh, the lethality of biological weapons within the range of nuclear attacks while being far more easily accessible to uh, terrorists than nuclear weapons. Fortunately, fortunately, in contrast to chemical and biological agents, terrorists cannot produce nuclear weapons, yet they might obtain them from those who can. At the root of the problem is the, trickle, uh, the trickling down to below the state level of the technologies and materials of mass killing. The greatest threat of nuclear proliferation into countries with low security standards and high levels of corruption is of the far increasing danger of leakage. Furthermore, states in the less developed and unstable parts of the world are ever in danger of disintegration and anarchy. When state authority collapses and anarchy takes place, who is to guarantee the country's nuclear arsenal? Pakistan with its past sales of nuclear know-how and potential instability is a much-discussed uh, case. Scenario, scenarios of world-threatening individuals and organizations, previously reserved to fiction of the James Bond genre, suddenly become real. Because deterrence based on mutual assured destruction scarcely applies to terrorists, the use of ultimate weapons is more likely to come from them than it is from states. Unconventional capability acquired by terrorists is usable. 
Indeed, once the potential exists, it's difficult to see what will stop it from materializing somewhere, sometime. I'll stop here just to you know, allay, allay your fears. Thanks so, very much. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. Um, As you, can, as you can see, I think you've certainly shifted some people's fears. Um, can I probe your reasoning a little? Please. Um, you say democracies don't go to war. India and Pakistan are democratic, but the intensity of exchanges of fire on the line of confrontation in Kashmir are sufficient for that to be classified as a limited war. Absolutely. Um, but, yeah, so since, you know... I had to cut things short. Affluent democracies do not go to war with one another. You remember, for example, that during antiquity, the classical democratic and republican city-states regularly went to war with one another. So, for example, Athens went to war during the Peloponnesian War against Syracuse, both of them democracies. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, the, uh, during the 4th century it joined Sparta, Athens joined Sparta against the rising power of the Bay. so democracies were among the most successful war waging uh, polities precisely because the people were among so I'm, I'm again citing democratic Athens Republican Rome. Why so? Because the people were among the main beneficiaries of war. That is the spoils of war and many other things. We, we, see, we see things changing in affluent democracy. So the interdemocratic peace only exists among affluent industrializing democracy, industrialized democracy. So Pakistan, for example, is especially the, uh, the conflict in, in uh, 1999, when both countries were democracies, uh, is an example that the uh, interdemocratic peace uh, works much less in the poorer parts of the world. Well, thank you. That, that certainly made me see things differently. Um, the other question I'd like to ask you is, given the hundreds of thousands of civilians who've died in Iraq and Afghanistan, yes. how do you explain that those wars and the leading role played by Britain and the US? So and, we, and also, your point about it not being seen worthwhile to die for your country anymore... Mm. In the UK and the US, there's enormous veneration verging on worship of veterans in general, and particularly veterans who've done brave things. For example, the recent award of a Medal of Honor to Sergeant Belavia in yeah. the White House. So uh, I'm back to the map here. And what you see is the complete absence of war within the developed parts of the world. Neither interstate war nor intrastate war when you see wars happening is in the poorer part. And there you have both local players fighting among themselves and within themselves and you have wars with uh, developed uh, uh, powers mostly, mostly intended to preserve these, the, uh, the existing world order of mutual prosperity and peace. So if, exam if, for example, Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait, the Americans intervene. They, were the pol they are, they have been, the policemen of the system of mutual prosperity and growth. Uh, and uh, again, after the war, of, on, after the uh, attack on the United States, uh, you see the United States reacting, not always wisely, not always uh, uh, you know, successfully, but the cause of this is clear. Just, just to make, how many, how many uh, aircraft do the Russians have in Syria? I'm sure that people here should know. How many aircraft do the Russians have in Syria? 
Give well, me a number. Well, I'd say at the height of it, you'd have to include helicopters and drones, but it's probably less than Yeah, a not uh, putting a too fine point on it. Yeah. How many? 30. Yeah, 30, 32, 34, okay? Now, the American Air Forces in the Middle East are 10 times larger and 10 times more sophisticated. The Israeli Air Force is roughly 10 times as large and as the uh, Russian contingent, air contingent in, in uh, Syria. And also several times more sophisticated. And yet the Russians were able to turn around the war in Syria and uh, bring the uh, uprising there to an end where Saddam had, uh, when uh, Assad had already been losing whereas the Americans and Israelis do not come close to such a spectacular success in their own counterinsurgency campaigns. You know, do you know why? All of you know why. Let's have the answer. Political ruthlessness and will. Uh, well, ruthlessness, but not political. Well, military ruthlessness. Yeah, absolutely. There was no problem for the Russian exactly to destroy the entire city of Aleppo with the civilians on the heads of the insurgents and the civilians. And this example was in, as they had done in, at, in, in Grozny and Chechnya. Uh, and, and once this was carried out, all the other strongholds uh, of the rebels in Syria, uh, you know, took the hint. They knew. What, they, what to expect, and most of them simply surrendered. So if we talk about civilian <coughs> casualties and so forth, uh, just, just a reminder. Right, well, I'll throw the floor open, catch my eye, and if I call on you, could you please say who you are and the organisation you come from? And I'll start with Eleanor Beaver, who works in our Conflict Security and Development Programme. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to sort of extend Ben's question a bit. I'm afraid I'm still somewhat... <coughs> unconvinced by the model that you put forward, it seems to me that what you've described is essentially variation on democratic peace theory, uh, but your claim is a much broader one that war as a whole uh, is declining across the globe. Um, to extend Ben's point really, that I, from your argument seems to be constructed from the perspective of the state examining it, um, the situation on its own territory, but frankly when what successful capitalist democracies have done is if they are going to fight wars, they export it to somebody else's territory uh, where they, um, it's not your own people and it's uh, not your own economy that's, uh, that's being troubled. This is a very common interpretation, but affluent democracy do not export their, their wars. They do not fight each other in other places, right? It's not that you see, uh, say, uh, you know, Britain and Germany fight each other rather than an, on their own territory, they fight it elsewhere. They always fight non-affluent and non-democratic countries, uh, which, and so it's not an export, first of all. Second, it's not a, it's not a variation of the democratic peace theory. Because, as I said, before 1800, democracies often fought each other. There was no special case. So what we see is, you can call it modernization peace or affluence peace. As I said, both Prussia and Austria barely fought during the 19th century, uh, again, to cite the, uh, the, um, the future chief of staff of, uh, the, of, of <coughs> Prussia. Uh, General von Moltke. In, 19, in, in 1841, he, he wrote that peace brings P Prussia so much more benefits than war, that war has become obsolete. He would later change his mind. But his train of thought was very similar to one, what John Stuart Mill uh, and uh, others were saying outside. So, again, Again, we are not talking here about exporting wars in the affluent world, nor are we talking here about a democratic peace. Though, obviously, affluence peace resonates most with the democratic powers. Forgive me, I wasn't talking about uh, wars between capitalist, wealthy democracies. Okay. I was talking about the fact that 
uh, you, your argument seems to be a dual economic and a cultural one that uh, restrictions on war have increased in liberal societies. I think that's true to a certain extent, uh, but it obviously has not prevented a very large number of uh, wars abroad in which the West has been involved. So what I'm saying is that we don't have this, uh, you know, and, and the same pictures throughout the globe. On the contrary, what we see is parts of the world that are modernized and, in, and, and affluent. You see the difference in wealth is astronomical. Uh, so the uh, affluent world has, uh, has a production per capita of, say, uh, let's include countries from uh, uh, $20,000 per capita onward. Uh, whereas the uh, rest of the world, uh, happily, uh, smaller and smaller parts of the world are far behind. Have so far many some parts of it have so far failed to embark on the road to modernization. So you have a story of two worlds. Half of the world is peaceful, including civil wars. Half of the world is still lives in what is predominantly a pre-modern world. May I respond to that? Have I got time? And then we'll widen the conversation outside double right, double S, but go on over. Uh, so you refer, you're going back to 1815 as the onset of uh, industry uh, and the sort of exportation, if you like, of Enlightenment thinking, but I'm refer, again, the encounter that much of the, what you would call the pre-modern world with the liberal in like the modern world was not a non-violent one. We are trying to cover too much. Of course it was not a, not a non-violent one. So during the late 19th century, as I said, in contrast to the middle of the 19th century, by the middle of the 19th century, you know, in Britain, they thought that, uh, that colonialism and imperialism is dead, that it wasn't worth the penny, uh, and, and uh, so it was all considered as part of the past. From the late 19th century, imperialism came back, mostly out of fear that if uh, that the world economy was going, the global economy created by 1900 was going to be partitioned among imperial uh, blocs. And this was the main cause, not only of the violence between the, mo the modernized and the non-modernized parts of the world, but also the cause of the conflict between the great powers that came back with a vengeance with the two, with the two world wars. Okay, uh, and what we, uh, <coughs> you know, we should what we should remember that the greatest war-making countries and the most destructive wars in history have always been between or among the great powers. This part of the story is largely gone, or we ho hopefully it's largely gone. It's gone in the most developed parts of the world. So this is a change, it's a massive change. Um. Let's broaden the conversation outside double I, double S. Time marches on, so I'm going to brigade questions together in pairs. There's a gentleman yeah. uh, right over on that side in a grey shirt and grey jacket, yeah. Uh, Philip Nelson, member of the Institute. I've got several questions, but I'll limit, limit myself to one. Thank you. Um, the long piece, which um, happily for me coincides more or less with my lifetime, also sees the unprecedented growth in world population tripling. Yeah. from about 2.5 yeah. to 7.5 yeah. billion, I think. Yeah. Does that have any implications for your analysis? I don't... Um. Can yeah. we just take a question from the gentleman in the white shirt behind C Can we do them one by one? Or? I'd rather group them. Oh, okay, case. okay, so, yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Ernest Rudolph. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, how do you place uh, what some people would call fifth-generation warfare or like social impact of social media today in the developed world? And in, um, like there's an ideological warfare going on, war, war about misinformation. How do you place your that? In yeah, process? thanks. Really useful questions. So, uh, demographics. I don't think that uh, it uh, changes much. And what we see, 
obviously uh, in uh, throughout the developed world and in large parts of the so-called developing world what we see of course is not only uh, a decline in fertility but uh, you know uh, uh, figures falling behind what demography uh, demographers call replacement replacement rate so what we see uh, is uh, even in Iran when the mullahs came to power uh, the fertility rate was uh, six children per uh, woman, and that's how demographers, demographers call it. I guess they'll have to change it somehow, the terminology I mean. Now we have 1.5 in Iran. Now this is a massive change. It means that within, uh, within a decade, Iran is going to face massive aging. This is problematic for the economy, obviously, and it's also problematic in the sense that, you know, older people are less inclined to be involved in military operations. <coughs> so, yeah, more or less, I hope that, you know, I have uh, uh, at least responded to your question, if not answered it. If not, <laughs> if not answered it. And the question yeah. on social media? So, so it's not only social media, obviously. We are talking cyber and other things. Yeah. So again, I guess that what we are going to see is that we are not going to see cyber war taking place or information war or whatever. We are not going to see it taking place within the developed world. Uh, the the uh, usual suspects are well known. So say, for example, with, uh, towards the United States and Western Europe, it's uh, obviously Russia, also China. Uh, and in the less fortunate part of the world, there's the part of the world I come from, so it, you know, Israel, Iran, and so forth. Uh, but within the developed world, we are not going to see, I, I guess, we are not going to see, you know, the kind of so-called warfare uh, taking place. Thank you. Uh, gentleman right at the back on that side. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, General. Um, you and Grant, um, former law enforcement intelligence analyst covering the Soviet Union, I later worked in Islamabad, um, and I can assure you I would certainly agree with uh, Brigadier Barry's assessment of that that was low-key warfare between India and Pakistan. Sure. It's truth. Um, my question really follows on from the previous gentleman's and, and your answer. Um, what do you see as the scope for authoritarian states to use technological warfare, um, cyber, but also, of course, um, technological dependence, and I'm not just talking about Huawei, against the West to, in other words, lower threshold, which has a the same aim as war, but not the same method. You don't mean kinetic war, that is... Non-kinetic non -kinetic. war. No, 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 no. Okay. Well, so, so, electric war. Yeah. Can we just take a question from the guy in the middle of the second row here on the left? Rob Millard, I'm a member of the Institute, and building a little bit on that previous question, when you put up your timeline, I couldn't help mentally superimposing on it the, 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 eco the, the industrial revolutions that the World, the world Economic sure. Forum talks about from the mid-18th century. Uh, and then a period of instability until a new order emerged, and then at the turn of the 19th into the 20th century, with the second, uh, that would have been the second industrial re revolution, and then the first and second world wars, until a new order emerged. And now we're talking about a fairly substantial industrial revolution of the same scale, if you conflate the third and the fourth digital revolution. And one wonders what kind of instability that might impose, because it's certainly creating a completely different power balance across the world. So okay. two very interesting related questions. So, as I said, I think that uh, there is, I don't need to say it, we know that it, this is taking place. So we know that both Russia and China uh, are involved in cyber and other you know, information activity throughout the, the uh, West and other parts of the developed world. We know this is taking place. Uh, my hope that this is not going to turn kinetic. And I don't think that we are going to see, actually see, you know, active war taking place. This is too dangerous. Uh, if nothing else, given the nuclear factor and other things, and many other things. Uh, but I do hope that we are not going to see, for example, uh, not only Cold War, say, in Southeast uh, Asia, 
but also kind of, uh, you know, uh, what you might call pushing and shoving, you know, in the South uh, China Sea, which is uh, terrifying, terrifying enough in itself, uh, both in its uh, potential for escalation and its, on, in its effect on, on the world economy. So all of these are, you know, prospects that we, uh, you know, must be prepared for, hope that, you know, work that they do not materialize, but, you know, it might happen. Okay, um, I've got time for a final round of questions, and I'll start with the gentleman in the corner here. Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Aaron Bourbon, recent uh, War Studies uh, King's MA graduate. Um, I guess going back to one of the points that was made earlier, I, I, a lot of the argument that it seemed like you were making was that it basically isn't worth going to war with our allies. It's far more productive and uh, uh, it more, far more beneficial to remain peaceful with one's allies, remain an op- uh, you know maintain an open market. Um, I'm curious what role you think the sort of post World War II Cold War uh, bipolar uh, powers uh, had to do with with aligning people against a common enemy. That that like how did that you know how did Western Europe aligning with the U.S. against the the Soviet Union affect the likelihood that they would go to war with one another because it was not in their interest geopolitically to do so. Okay, lady in black and white dress in the front. Um, thanks for a sort of tour de force of history, really. Um, my question is, do you think that there are lessons that we can learn by, by looking at the, the sort of arc of history and how, um, as you say, the, sort of the, the, the great wealthy powers have um, become, become more peaceful? Or are we in such a different world right now? Um, and also like looking at the, the history of those, those great powers and how they have become wealthy, it has often been on the backs of the poorer, the poorer countries and, and colonization and things. And given that they can't grow in that, take that same traje- trajectory, are there actually lessons that we can learn or is, is the world just so different now that actually who knows what, what the future will hold? Do we have an hour? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, could you say who you are and where Sorry, you're from? Sorry, I'm Hayley Davidson from Crisis Action. Okay, I'm going to have to draw a line there. Um, but two very useful last questions. Right. So, um, so uh, the Soviet threat uh, was certainly a spa on the sides of the you know, various countries of uh, not only Europe, but also Japan. So it brought, uh, you know, in concentrated, to, to use the metaphor again, it concentrated the mind of Germany uh, brilliantly. Uh, it helped bring about the transformation of both these countries, Germany and Japan. Uh, after the disaster, so there were two, uh, you know, b- both the disaster that each of them experienced, and it was clear to them in 1945 that they had undergone a, a, a disaster of, of massive proportion, and the, uh, the uh, notion that the Soviet Union was just across the border. So all of them, uh, both of these factors contributed massively to the incorporation of uh, Germany and Japan in the West, the adoption of de- democracy, which was perhaps the greatest uh, um, geostrategic uh, change of the 20th century. It also, it also helped the United States convince its allies, most notably Britain, to, uh, to, uh, dis- in, uh, to demolish you know, tariffs and uh, the empire. So yes, contingent factors always are involved. American power is the most important of all of them. And the rivalry with the Soviet Union uh, was there. If the question implies that now, when the Soviet Union is a threat, when the Soviet threat is no longer there, uh, the United States and Europe might find themselves in a military antagonistic relationship, or that the countries of Western Europe might find themselves in a military antagonistic relationship, I doubt, very much doubt, both propositions. 
Yep, and uh, lessons, you know. Even if we do not have lessons, and obviously we learn lessons all the time as we go, some of them wrong, some of them, you know, more to the point. Uh, but we, we live through it. We feel it. So even if we do not know exactly why it is that we don't want to go to war, uh, we still feel it very deeply, no matter what the real causes for this notion widespread notion within the Western societies is. It's the work of historian and analyst to, to figure out why this is so. But the people feel it. Uh, so, uh, so uh, and this is a, uh, this is, you know, the mo a most significant uh, social power which determines politics and so forth. And just one more comment uh, about what you said. It's again used to be very common, and still is, uh, you know, widely held that the prosperity of the developed world has come at the expense of the developing, uh, undeveloped world. This is not true. The opposite is the case. It always has been so. And what you see today, again, we have no time, but what you see today is that, you know, cursed system of capitalism taking hundreds of millions of people in uh, East Asia, in Southeast Asia, in South Asia, from a position of, you know, biblical poverty, uh, wealth per capita of, of one dollar a day, into uh, you know, middle class existence. This is a long process, we know it is. It took a century uh, in Europe. It took two generations in Japan, in South Korea, in Taiwan. Both countries were poorer than Egypt in 1950. They were among, among the world poorest in 1950. It took two generations for them to uh, uh, to um, embrace modernization successfully. In principle, Adam Smith already knew all of it. In principle, this is uh, to the advantage of all those involved. Well, Professor, thank you very much indeed. Um, like you, I... I have a deep abiding interest in history and recently I've discovered this relatively new discipline called big history which is looking at long scales of time and it's looking at something really standing back from a great distance and sometimes you can discern trends and shapes that with your nose close up you sometimes sometimes miss um, and you've certainly uh, challenged my pre preconceptions and you've made me look at war and peace in a new way, uh, for which I'm very grateful. But I'm afraid you've also reinforced um, my residual worry about tensions of sliding frictions and tectonic plates between the US and China. But thank you very much indeed for a very, very stimulating Thank you. Hour.